afternoon, everybody. Um, as Alison has introduced me, my name is Chris Underwood, and I'm not Argentine, as despite my uh, country of residence. I, in fact, worked here with Christopher Dobbs on the Mary Rose years ago with the Nautical Archaeology Society uh, before leaving um, to Argentina in 2005, although I'd been there on, in 2004. Ah, somebody's. And what took me over there was actually to work on a, another shipwreck, an English shipwreck called Swift, uh, which sank in 1770. And in a way, it came at a fantastic time in my particular career development or life. Kids grown up, new challenge, and also in a way to experience something extremely similar to the Mary Rose experience, which really, in, in, in a sense, was totally absorbing. And of course, Christopher's talked about that in many parts of the world as well. What I want to talk about today is, in a way, my new role or an additional role. I still do occasional work for the NAS in terms of international development. Um, I'm a researcher at the National Institute of Anthropology and Latin American Thought um, and involved in Latin American projects. But also, I'm currently the president of ICOMOS ICUCH, which ICUCH is the International Committee on the Underwater Cultural Heritage. And I want to start by talking a little bit about what we do. And in fact, this global chart, which shows the membership of ICOMOS generally, there's something like 11,000 members, 144 countries represented, and a whole bunch, is that national commissions? Yeah, countries, uh, 110 national committees, and 28 scientific committees, which cover a whole gambit, ambit of international cultural heritage management and the like. ICUJ happens to be one of the 28 um, international scientific committees. We have 56 members or so, and they represent 44 different countries. And in fact, Christopher and myself uh, normally, re well, I certainly normally represent the United Kingdom. Christopher's obviously in a much better place than that for me, for that particular part. But what it's given me, I suppose, the opportunity to do is to gather information about what's happening in other parts of the world. And currently, we're actually providing nominees for, uh, um, what's the initial stage, the, um, the nominations for World Heritage in, um, in Greenland, which is a, a Denmark um, Inuit settlement site, China, and one in Oman. And basically, we're looking for experts to be involved in the expert missions and the desk space assessments of, for uh, listing on the World Heritage. They have a combination of uh, land and, let's say, harbour environments. We're also involved in monitoring development activity in Nesabar in Bulgaria, where there's a threat to the underwater side of the World Heritage site there. Um, there's a harbour development which is going to increase the harbour mole. It's going to be extended 150 metres. There'll be bigger boats. And for those of you who know a little bit about archaeology in the UK, and particularly the Channel Islands, the, the threat is bigger vessels, bigger prop wash, excavating, you know, without anybody seeing, revealing uh, sites that go back to the Byzantine period. So we're sort of commenting on that and also monitoring active, similar activity in Gaul Harbour, where there's another development. Um, and some of you will be familiar with the Avonster project that happened there um, probably in the 90s and 2000s, which is a Dutch East Indian. So there's a whole range of activities, similar threats, similar issues to the UK, but I deliberately trying to avoid everything that's happening here because Alison and, and, and Vic and uh, Katie are much more together on what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis here. The themes I wanted to touch on are these, really. Um, communication and language. International frameworks, and within that I should certainly be mentioning the UNESCO Convention. Professional training, and I broadly devote, uh, divided that up into academic and non-academic. Um, publications and their, the impact on, on global standards that I believe is, is happening. And development of marine archaeology in Latin America. You might be interested to see how a region is, is evolving in a quite a similar way to how it evolved here. Um, touch on media, and then maybe review and look at some of the challenges that we face from a global perspective. Like many of us now, when I, when I volunteered to give this presentation, 
I had my own views on what standards apply to our discipline. And I think we all have our own view on standards. But then I thought, well, let's have a look and see what the internet has to say. And Google it, and sure enough, there's a whole bunch of stuff. And I think it reveals a particular issue that we face, is that standards are developed by customary practice. Well, that customary practice can be extremely good, but it also can be not so good. We can also look at the ethical side of it, and I wasn't going to touch too much on the ethics. Uh, there are ethical codes of practice in, most, in many countries, uh, including the UK. But it just throw up, uh, um, in fact, what I was particularly interested in was the concept of communication. Because if we have standards, then the way we get everybody to abide by those standards must be through some form of communication. And I wanted to also take us back a little bit to look at what happened in the past. We're all pretty much aware of the, the history of the discipline, the history of maybe archaeology. But there were some very interesting statements made on quite significant projects in the 50s, for example. Grand Congler, everybody's familiar with Cousteau. And he came after five years of unsuccessful, or probably successful excavation in, insofar as digging holes, but not successful in terms of addressing what would be considered valid research perspectives in the 21st century. And after five years of, of excavating, he came to the conclusion that you needed an archaeologist to work out what was going on on the site. They originally started thinking it was a, a single site, but found a range of amphora spreading over 100 years, which made it less likely that it was a single site um, investigation. And in fact, when the archaeologists got involved, it very quickly turned out to be a site with two different shipwrecks from two different periods. But it throws up the, the issue of training standards and licensing and permitting and all the things that are very relevant to us today. And in fact, at the same time, or very soon after that, George Bass claimed, or it's claimed, that this is the first scientific excavation in Cap Galadonia in Turkey, using acceptable standards, at least in the 1960s. And then... I'm also looking for benchmarks in, in the past. If you look at and read all the text in the 1972, the first volume of the IJNA and underwater exploration, as it was then called, it wasn't just about nautical archaeology, and that's reflected in the contents of the journal. You're aware of, and in fact, these are extracts from letters to the journal complaining about standards around the world. And it exemplifies where good standards were happening in terms of uh, Scandinavia, some in Germany, and in Switzerland, at this time, the Palafites, you know, the, the um, submerged settlement sites are being excavated by Ulrich Ruoff. And if you've ever visited what they're doing on those sites today, some of the archaeology is an extremely high standard. So people were complaining. And the first manual started to appear. You see uh, Bill St. John Wilkes' Nautical Archaeology. And if you look at the contents of that, it's actually quite similar. The techniques have moved on, obviously, 30, 40 years. But... The contents and the approach is actually quite similar to you know, the NES handbook or, or, in fact, the UNESCO handbook, which I'll talk to you a little bit about later. And the nascent discipline came out, and the contents of that is much more international. Bill talks about his own experiences in, in Africa, whereas um, the nascent discipline talks about work in all sorts of different places. And again, looking at IJNA for its first peer-reviewed papers, and peer review is extremely important in this uh, context, Four sites are, are thoroughly, well, when I say thoroughly, they're quite extensive publications of 15 to 20 pages. And the last one talks about Port Royal, which actually uh, was inundated in, uh, was it, we put 1692 uh, by an earthquake. It's about 10 acres of submerged settlement, which had been picked over, not just from this time, right the way through to the present day, in fact. And the, the discussion in the, this particular issue was about what to do with it, how to manage it, and whether it could be world heritage. And they're still struggling with that concept today, 40 years on, despite various attempts to have it uh, put on the tentative listing. I want to talk about existing international framework. Most of you will be familiar with the Valletta Convention, which applies to the UK. It signed up to that some years ago, and I can't remember exactly what. The ICOMAS Charter was developed by ICUCH. It was its first mandate from, the night, from 1991 and was published in 1996 and uh, accepted by ICOMOS General Council, and in fact that forms the basis of the rules in the annex to the 2001 Convention. So in a way, ICOMOS and ICUCH are 
inextricably linked to the 2001 Convention, which actually gives us an extremely good platform for the advocacy and the, the work that we do. Ali mentioned the 56 states. What I was interested in in terms of global standards and how they might be applied, it's interesting to look at the scope of the ratifications by region. The five regions are those chosen by UNESCO or those designated by UNESCO. You've got Latin America and Caribbean, Europe and North America, Arab states, Africa and Asia and Pacific. Now it's pretty obvious who's perhaps grasped the convention. You can see that the figures in brackets represent the total number of states in those listed by UNESCO in those regions. So more or less 50% of the people in Latin America of Caribbean have signed up to the convention. And you can see Asia and Pacific, only Cambodia. And Cambodia is a landlocked state, as far as I'm aware. One of the questions people ask, why do landlocked states decide to use the convention? Well, it actually provides them with an international reference point. The convention was designed to fill the vacuum between states' waters. In other words, it could be up to the 200 nautical mile EEZ into the area in the deep sea. Well, in fact, it actually provides a legal, a sort of semi-legal framework. It's not law, it's convention, but it's, it provides a semi-legal framework for domestic uh, legislation. And it also is a bit like a safety net. Paraguay is the same. Bolivia, the 56 states ratify, is also landlocked, but claims access to the sea. So there's lots of little political issues in all of this too, which sometimes you're not quite so aware of. But interestingly, having done quite a bit of work in, in uh, Asia, um, there is ambivalence towards the, the way that the convention can be applied in Asia generally. And in fact, running a course in Thailand a year ago, the chairman of the cultural heritage point was extremely ambivalent. And in fact, the whole course was aimed at, in a sense, showing that there are alternative pathways, including excavation. Well, of course, that excavation and preservation in situ have been blown out of all proportion. Preservation in situ is seen as, you know, this is what we're going to do. In other words, do nothing, and we're not allowed to excavate. Well, that's absolute rubbish. And what people are not doing is reading Article 1, or whatever it is, and saying preservation in situ is the first option. And it doesn't say the only option after that. It says when all due management processes have been done, you can do what you like with it, but at least take a step back and design your project accordingly. Oh, right. So you can see from here, it doesn't mean there's no standards in Asia, it's just a different mental perspective to things that are becoming customary practice elsewhere much more rapidly. Does it work? Yeah. Okay, professional training. And again, you, I, I split this up by, by region. And you can see Europe and North America leapfrogs forward. You can see the basis of many of the courses that have, they're either PhD, uh, MAs, MSCs, etc., right the way through to occasional modules in a, in a, graduate, a postgraduate program. They're not full, fully blown um, programs, but they are represented in all of those countries. And it's quite significant. And that gives you a bit of a clue as to where people are going to address the ethics, the standards, and look at things perhaps in a little bit more detail than poor old Africa, uh, which currently does not have, to my knowledge, uh, any program at all, and is reliant on in, input from other states' parties. Now, I was hesitant putting zero because I know that uh, some, some of you will know John Gribble, who worked with Wessex, and I know that he probably does some, his best within the SARA framework within South Africa. But to my knowledge, there isn't a program, there isn't a module, there isn't a course as such. So Africa and the Arab states in, the, in this part, in this particular sense, are quite poorly represented. You see in Latin America, I'll talk a little bit more in um, the slides I've got on Latin America. But there's also other international frameworks linked to academic training which could be of use. I don't expect you to read all the texts. In fact, this was my best attempt to synthesize the rather academic version of the, the bullet points. It's pages, basically. But I think what you should try and take from it is that there are an increasing number of universities who are twinning with the aims of doing harmonization, collaboration, project support. And in fact, if I forget to say it, in our Argentine 
context, my particular unit within the Institute is wanting to be um, a member of the Uniswim organization, probably as an associate, it's not a fully blown program, with the view that it will help students in Latin America and certainly Argentina to apply for funding to actually attend courses or programs in Europe or North America, whatever they want. They'll just facilitate. The full members, you can read for yourselves, but Flinders hold the current chair um, with um, a couple of people holding the responsibility. Lucy Blue, you'll probably know, is, is also heavily involved in Uniswin. They're quite familiar names. And in fact, there's a whole list of associate members who have training or courses which are not full-blown masters who are actually associates. And there are also NGOs and government organizations who are sort of recognized participants and observers. Non-academic, there's quite a scope for this in a way, in that I'm, for the last eight years, been involved in developing and delivering the UNESCO Foundation courses in a variety of countries. And in fact, the first ones were delivered in Thailand with a £2 million grant from the Norwegian government, um, which some might ask why Norway... I know it's a crazy question, isn't it? No, and I haven't really got a good answer. It's just that foreign aid grants like soft... You know, soft foreign policy, they find their way into UNESCO's pockets. Um, that provided the opportunity to run three of the foundation courses, which run over six weeks. Um, Jamaica, we were there in 2012, I think it was. Uh, St. Eustatius a couple of years ago. Argentina three years ago. And Vietnam, which is also quite interesting because Vietnam has also integrated NES as a vehicle for introducing UCH to um, Vietnamese nationals. So that's quite an interesting, slightly, slightly different. A range of shorter courses which obviously within two, one to two weeks is you're limited to what you can do with them but they do try and follow some of the module um, units that we have within the, the bigger foundation course which takes six, six weeks, six days a week, 12 hours a day. It's extremely intensive. The people from the courses come from all over the region. The Thai courses came from most parts of Asia, and there's all sorts of little political things like um, if they go, we don't go, if we go, they don't go. And sometimes there's quite a lot of massaging to make sure that all countries can go. Um, some have got uh, legal or even military disputes on the border. So there are some subtleties which are certainly beyond our control. And in fact, our recruitment is often governed by UNESCO national commissions. And that doesn't necessarily mean we always get the right people. The courses are also delivered in English, which is also a limiting factor. And language, I think, permeates many of these things that I'm talking about today. Um, Colombia is quite interesting because um, we happened to be there when the Colombians declared they'd found the San Jose. And probably many of you are aware of that particular project. Now, interestingly, um, we, were no, we weren't actually told that there was even a search while we were delivering a course under the banner of UNESCO, which is quite convenient for the Colombian government, I guess. But also, there's what I would describe as the Mercedes effect, insofar as the Colombians, I would say a few years ago, would probably have done this as a treasure hunt, lift it, sell it, and make the best of it they can. But the Mercedes effect has essentially made the issue of sovereignty much more powerful. And the, and the Spanish have said, when we don't have any particular interest in the Mercedes. It, I, we don't even know if it's in uh, Colombian national waters or international waters, but they will insist that it will be done according to the annex to the convention. So there's an application on a project that probably would have been done in a very different way. And you could, you could certainly feel that when within the country. And there's a future course in Taiwan, which actually isn't recognized as a state party. It's part of China as far as China's concerned, but it will follow more or less the, the foundation course. Basically, the, the concept behind the foundation course is to build capacity. There's a lot of things said and written about capacity. Most of the people we have in our courses are existing workers, often within government, uh, which actually is quite useful because they can have a bit more influence. Sometimes they're not. And we even get sport divers who have got an interest in, in wrecks. That's either the best person or he knows the person in the National Commission to get the, the ticket. And so we're a bit limited on things like that. The inter I suppose the thing about the foundation course, which is slightly different to most courses, is it's very much management orientated, where archaeology is a tool of management rather than a single focus. And in fact, that shows a progression from 
from the earlier days where most courses were archaeological based and management is something that's been gradually permeated through the discipline over more recent years. Um, you don't, again, you don't need to read all of these, but 50 countries represented, not all of them successful for sure, uh, but some quite successful and some have gone on to do postgraduate and PhD, uh, PhDs or masters at Leiden, Oxford, Southampton, um, others. Students have become trainers, so the big belief in, in fact, Martin Manders from RCU is sort of partner in crime in this, in terms of ownership of, of um, one's cultural heritage. I mean ownership in a cultural social way, not a pecuniary way. Um, and so there's a, hopefully a virtuous circle in passing over responsibility for training and capacity building within each domestic, um, in each state party, basically. Something that's very important is the creation of networks and the, and the benefit of doing intense residential courses is that people have the opportunity to meet people from other countries with similar problems, so there's problems shared. And also the network is a legacy that extends beyond um, the course. And in fact, it becomes mutual help, mutual support. If they have a project in Honduras, it's the people, or Cuba, this person in Cuba rings the friends from the course and they can put a team together. And in fact, that's actually very similar to what ha actually happened in, in Argentina 20 or uh, 30 years ago. NES, and some of you will probably maybe say, oh, isn't NES for, for recreational divers? Well, in fact, in the early days of NES, and maybe still now, you did get graduate, uh, get students who were doing archaeology where there wasn't a, a maritime program looking to add additional experience. And in fact, in Latin America, in most parts of the world where we have training partners, if you look at the, the demography of the courses, there's quite a heavy component of students or people looking to get into professional commercial archaeology or archaeology or wondering what all of this underwater archaeology is all about. That still happens. So it plays quite a good, crucial role. And in fact, in Argentina, all the students that came, have come through the program have been actually processed, if you like, through the Nautical Archaeology Society training program. So it has a useful function. And you can see here clearly where it's represented most. And interestingly, as an aside, is that most, many of our training partners are now in, the, in North America. And in fact, it would have seen, seemed to me that as funding decreases in North America, that the concept of community and, and public archaeology, depending on your, on your, you know, your definition of those, those terms, is growing quite quickly. Because everybody's looking to offload like government jobs and replace them with community-based philanthropic uh, funding. Nobody has a heritage lottery funding like we do here, which is amazing in a sense. So they're looking to replace it with local funded community projects. And that seems to be a trend as well. And it's important that there's some mechanism for ensuring that the standards applied to the work that all avocationals, recreationals and professionals do conform to some sort of minimum standard. That's really important. <clears throat> Publications. And again, if you look at the, I got this off the internet, it's probably not totally accurate, but again, it shows you a disparity in where the, the publications are. And most of them are in English, which is also a little bit of a, I suppose it's a, a barrier to those people who don't speak English in, in other countries. It's not a complete barrier, but it is a barrier. Because they have to get somebody to translate or at least do the abstract in English or so forth. So it's a, it's a barrier. And again, going back to IJNA, if you remember the, the, uh, the letters wanting international representation. I've used the advisory editors from the IJNA, but if you look at the Journal for Maritime Archaeology or other journal, if you will, that's also quite internationally based. And I know that IJNA is now having international content with different languages for their abstracts, not yet fully translated, but at least the abstracts are in the mother tongue. And I think that's an extremely useful step forward and should encourage more publications from different countries. Manuals and handbooks, you're probably fully familiar with these. Again, most of them are in English, but I think if you, if you truly want to communicate and publish your own standards, then you must look to multilingual publications. And I think that's where UNESCO has a bit of an advantage in the sense that 
they have five or six standard languages and most of their publications eventually get transferred into those. ICOMOS is French and, and English, still a bit of a barrier but covers most things. And um, so I would encourage people to look to doing multilingual uh, stuff. Historic England, people overseas <coughs> recognize the, the quality of the management in England particularly. Anything with the label Oxford and Cambridge is given a, a kudos that sometimes, I hope there's nobody from Oxford and Cambridge here, but sometimes don't actually warrant, but it's an automatic, it's an automatic must be good, stamp of approval. And of course there are issues involving that, and I'm, I'm being a bit, bit picky, I'm talking about things that happened in the, in the past 20 years ago. <clears throat> International Symposia, we've got ISBSA, is it number 18 in 2017 or whatever, 2018? ICOVA, European Congress, this year, last year, went to Australia. Terrific standard of papers, and it's a way of communicating standards. It may be a little bit indirect, but people look at what other people are doing. They look at what the approaches, the methodologies, the project designs, the management strategies. So it permeates much wider than even the, the small number of people that actually go to Congress. And Asia has its own now, and the third one will be in Hong Kong in later this year. Okay, how am I doing for time, Ali? Seven minutes. Seven minutes, okay, good to go. Development of marine archaeology in Latin America. I'm going to use Argentina as an example because it was, it's one of the earliest ones and probably um, fairly well developed. Argentina is all that landmass you see up, up to the, the white line down the middle, which is the snow capped peaks of the Andes. Massive 5,000 kilometers north south from some, uh, <laughs> it's what? <laughs> Basically, it's 5,000 kilometers long and about 2,000 kilometers wide. Huge area, lakes, everything you, everything you could possibly want. Very small number of people to do it, including the, I've got to be careful what I say here, it's the Falklands Malvinas, uh, just in case this gets to my friends in Latin America. Um, and again, I, I, I've tried to simplify this, but essentially, a bit like many countries who have not done maritime or underwater archaeology before, they find something that's interesting and important, and it captures maybe the public's imagination. And some of you may recognize that the year has been quite important, both for Argentina and for the UK. And it actually prevented the project from being initiated in 1982, that particular issue. Everybody knows what I'm talking about, presumably, uh, because some of the, the, the divers who were instrumental in doing the work on the project were actually sent to the Malvinas Islands as, uh, as clearance divers. So there was a delay, but it, in fact, the, the, the SWIFT was actually um, protected. It was given national protection pretty much immediately. It was recognized as being nationally important. They weren't remotely interested in it being into, uh, nationally important to the UK for obvious reasons. And that's still the case now. There are still um, quite significant barriers to doing some things with the SWIFT that we might otherwise like to do. And you can see, so there's a, a burgeoning sort of legal framework, but only single-sided. Um, you see personal support, personal equipment, personal interest. But from 1997, or between 2000, um, 1982 and 1997, there were intermittent investigations done by non-archaeologically led teams. But in 1997, that changed when the Institute, National Institute of Anthropology was approached and it, there was a transition between, let's say, anybody doing it in whichever way they wanted to a research-driven, project-design-driven uh, project that has continued from, 19, uh, from 1997 through to 2008. The publication on the right-hand side was the, basically the uh, synopsis of, of everything that had been done up to that point. And at the moment, it remains a dormant project, sort of. And you can see from then, there is an evolution into doing desk-based assessments, management becomes an issue. Um, we've done ground surveys of things that were mentioned in the World Heritage this morning in terms of Montevideo, it's a new national park. Some of the problems that they were, they were talking about are very familiar to us in Argentina. And you can see the Argentines ratified in 2010, but implementation and interpretation 
is something that is very much states party orientated. And there is, I think there's a project at Southampton University that's talking about, that's investigating implementation of the 2001 Convention. It's all very well signing up, but it obligates you to a whole lot of articles and a whole lot of rules. And not all of those rules and articles are certainly implemented straight away. And in fact, they're still, in Argentina, still argu well, not arguing, not even discussing it, who's going to be the competent authority. Because organizations like the Navy have um, huge powers, huge influence, still like the MOD here, still have influence. Maybe it's been mitigated a bit, but still have influence. The Navy in Latin America is extremely strong. And in fact, one of the blocks there is about international capacity. People came from all over Latin America and further afield to gain experience working on a site because it wasn't common to have excavations or even a, a sort of large, when I say a large scale project, it was nothing like, don't imagine it like Mary Rose or Vasa or something. It wasn't. Very small, humble project by, com by comparison. In fact, you might say even very modern because it wasn't a total excavation. It had five or six different research chains, very specific. But the opportunity was given to archaeologists in Uruguay, Chile, Peru, and elsewhere. So that spurns different programs in different countries who look, definitely looking at Argentina as a model that they can evolve with. I think the other thing that was again said again in the World Heritage um, meeting this morning or the, the, the session is that you have to take account of the cultural differences between states' parties. And that, that, can evolve, that can be anything from language to religion to attitudes to risk. All sorts of things are very different. You can't apply one brush to the 200 and whatever it is countries we have in the, in, under the UNESCO banner. That's not going to happen. But I think what you can do is set models, and I think a little bit like we try to do with the foundation course where we have multiple, the trainers come from different countries, is you offer, let's say, a menu from which the local people can choose what fits their own particular national perspective. <coughs> That's very different from going, okay, we're gonna do the sort of historic England model everywhere in the world. Well, you can pick bits from it, and I'm sure they'll work. But for very different reasons and which have very little to do with cultural heritage, not all of them will work. Their legal frameworks are different. Their cultural frameworks are different. Their attitudes to overseas countries. They love receiving, Latin America loves receiving Spanish money. But they don't want Spain to, as this post-colonial ism there is, they do not want Spain telling them what to do with their archaeology. So... Those are all issues that will have to be taken into account in terms of our globalization and making sure everybody's doing things to at least a minimum standard. But having said that, countries do look at historic Scotland, historic England, National Park Service, Canadian Park Service, the country, Australia. They all look at those countries for ideas, not necessarily leadership, but for ideas and models that might work in a particular domestic environment. So there is a globalization, but it isn't going to be, you know, the post-colonial Spanish taking over their p previous colonies. That's not going to, or the English or whatever. That's just not going to happen, particularly now with the rise of populism. There's also UNESCO Best Practice, which is, has been established since 2011. There's a whole list of um, terrestrial sites. And now there are going to, it's basically about community involvement, um, not necessarily archaeological best practice, but community involvement and dissemination. And there have been six nominations for UCH, which will be voted upon and discussed at the state's party meeting in this May in Paris. So I don't know whether it will be accepted. If you look at the um, descriptions, they're quite, in fact, very thin in a way, but I think UNESCO doesn't want, at this stage, massive protocols and pages and pages and pages. And I think one or two of you may have heard me talk about media, and never has there been a time, I guess, in the, in the history of our discipline to be not aware of how media have grabbed archaeology as a subject, as a discipline, to focus their publications. This is just something extracted from National Geographic. I'm not promoting National Geographic as a necessarily a publication, but it has grabbed UCH maritime archaeology, marine stories in a very big way. And it would be foolish of us not to 
take advantage of those opportunities. MOOCs. This is the, the Dutch equivalent of Southampton's. It's free. Uh, anybody can do it. And I can tell you that people in our office, the students, are doing these MOOCs as part of their professional development. You can see that they're funded or partnered by a number of universities. Access is free. They're not, there's no particular qualification, to my knowledge, at the end of this. But it's been driven by the problems that we face in terms of looting, exploitation, and, dare I add, even what's called sustainable tourism. And just on the thoughts, returning, trying to square the circle of the presentation, I went back to 1972. Peter Throckmorton may not be known to many of you, but he was a journalist who was instrumental in getting George Bass to work in um, Turkey in the, the 60s. He made these comments, and I thought it was very appropriate to think here we are 40-some years up ahead, and we're, the things that Peter was talking about in being limitations to our recording are now, are they almost there or are they truly there? We're certainly heading in the right direction. So I suppose the point I need to make is that standards are fluid, they're not static, and there needs to be a constant review based on the, the technologies, the methodologies, the culture, and the societies that's applying all of those things. And you can read the summary. But we do face challenges. I think there is a global process expanding. It's not just the UNESCO Convention. There are other things as well. And I'm very conscious of you know, the, uh, the, the various NGOs in the UK doing their overseas projects. Um, that's got to be a good thing. But it has to be sensitive to the local community. It's not about, I keep using this word, post-colonialism. And there isn't a bit of that mentality sometimes. It's about being sympathetic to a developing nation needing help not abuse. Okay, thanks very much for listening.